Okay, I think we're online now, and I wanted to welcome you to the Journal Gemology webinar through the Gemological Association of Great Britain. And I'm Brendan Lors, the Editor-in-Chief of Journal Gemology. And today, um, uh, you may have noticed in the past, we've been joined by Alan Hart, but unfortunately he couldn't be here due to another obligation. But the good news is, is that we're joined by one of our authors, Justin Prim. So hi, Justin. Hi, Brendan, how's it going? Great, great. Thanks for, for joining us today. And it's really nice to have you here to um, discuss a little bit about the article that you have on the, the cover article for this issue of the journal. Um, but before we, we launch into that, just a few background items I wanted to go over. Um, everyone is muted and the webcams are off so the participants can just see Justin and myself and uh, in our PowerPoint. And um, you can submit questions, or if you have any technical issues, you can mention those through the chat function, um, which we'll be monitoring. Um, and then just as a quick recap, the Journal of Gemology has been published since 1947, and it's the, uh, the GEMA's journal has been recognized as a leader in its field for uh, many decades, and it covers uh, original research on all aspects of gemology. Um, it's also included in the SCIE database, which is a prestigious database that's covered by the scientific community um, as a, one of the peer-reviewed journals. And in, and in doing so, we have what's called an impact factor, which is a measure of the citation rate of the articles. And the most recent impact factor that we got in July, we just learned that it was increased to 1.375. So we're very pleased about that too. Um, and I'd really like to thank all of our authors, uh, Justin and, and everyone else who contributes to the journal um, for their wonderful uh, insights and sharing their knowledge with us. And also the um, editorial re review board or the associate editors for their help with maintaining and ensuring the um, integrity and, and rigor and high quality of the articles that we publish. So um, with that, Justin, I, I'd like to turn it over to you to uh, discuss the first article. Cool. Well, thanks for having me, Brendan. I'm super happy to be able to join you here uh, today. And so, yeah, my my article in this issue is the history of London's lapidaries, part one. So the idea with the article is I wanted to tell the story of gem cutting in London because, of course, London is one of Europe's major gem cutting hubs and it has been for hundreds of years as you can find out in the article so i i started the story you know going way back really way way further back than than most of the scope of the article but i wanted to give an example that we can see on the screen that is you know what what would have a gem cutter have been doing in the uk you know in in sort of the dark ages you know in the in the early medieval period and so the staffordshire horde seem like a perfect example. I had seen a lot of these pieces before and they're they're super interesting because nobody actually knows exactly how they're done. I mean, we we have ideas and I talk about it in the article and you know, I cite some references, but most of that stuff is um speculation, right? We're using the best knowledge that we have, but nobody actually knows because nothing's left you know, as far as technology goes to see how are they actually doing this. So I, I, but we, you know, we draw some conclusions and we're looking at some of this beautiful garnet set in the gold and thinking that, they, you know, they're probably doing this with copper and then drawing some correlations between what these guys were doing way, way back and then how London cutters today are still using copper, you know, and, and abrasives. So starting the story here, um, in the, with the Staffordshire Horde. And so uh, let's go to the next slide and we can see the story goes on. We get into um, the late medieval period and, I, and, and, and really what I wanted to talk about with this article is about the history of faceting in London. So we're just looking at colored stones, not diamonds, and we're not really talking about cabochons and carvings too much. But I wanted to look at what is some of the earliest colored stones that we can find in the UK, and this one on the left here, it's, it's really one of my favorite pieces of jewelry. I had the privilege of seeing this in person right before COVID stopped, stopped us. So I, was in, I got to go to London for a couple of months thanks to a grant from the Society of Antiquaries of London. So they gave me enough money to be able to spend two months, two months doing this research for this article. And so 
um, this ring here on the left, uh, which is in the Victoria and Albert Museum, I got to go in and, and I got to go behind the scenes and they let me actually handle it and look at it in the microscope and, you know, really check it out. Because from the photo, it's really hard to tell. You know, it, it, it's obviously got a big flat face and it's faceted around the sides, but I was always curious, you know, is the back faceted? Is that really a drill hole in the middle? You know, is the polish good? Because, you know, there's just some things you can only see in person. And so they let me kind of come in for an, a few hours and, and play around with some of the, the pieces that I'd always wanted to see, which was awesome. And so, uh, you know, we and we got to use the photo for the article. So that's really cool to just look at where does the story of faceting begin? And we can see the in the picture on the right, some of the, um, the steps that the gem cutting went through from this early period, you know, beginning of the Renaissance and end of the mid medieval period, and then all the way up until you know, the end of this article, the end of part one ends kind of in the end of the Renaissance or the end of the 17th century. So we get, we just start to get into the brilliant cut, but you can see that we go through a couple different steps along the way. So, so the, the ring we see here, would that be an example of a step cut then, an early step cut? Uh, actually, it's it's more of a table cut because mm. The, the difference being, if you see on the, the table cut, it's just basically one, one set of facets on top, right? There's a table and then just those four around the edge. Whereas the step cut usually has more than one step, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four. So, but the table cut and the step cut are, I mean, you could consider the table cut to be a simple step cut, right? It's, it's just a one step cut instead of a multi-step cut. So they're they're basically, cousins i mean they're they're obviously directly descended but i would call it a table cut because it only has one row of facets around the top and the bottom doesn't have any facets it's just um mm. i'm guessing it's a bead backing but there's no there's you know that's just from my own visual evidence of looking at it within the microscope but it seemed to be like a cabochon on the back you know mm. it was it was sort of roughly polished and dimpled and i thought oh this is an old bead but of course we can't take it out to to mm. see and it's closed in the back so there's no way to really know other than just looking through but it's a quite dark stone um so it's hard to say but yeah. it's amazing because it's from the 1300s i mean this was perfect for the article but outside of the article just my my general love of european gem cutting history this is the oldest faceted stone from Europe that I've ever seen. So the fact that it's in London makes it extra cool because, we, you know, for the article, it, it's great because we got to use it. But even in the wider picture of European gem cutting, the only faceted stones I've ever seen older than this are from like Persia. And, you know, they're from way earlier and they're from a totally different story, essentially. But for Europe, this is actually the oldest one that survives. This is actually older than any documented faceting machine so i don't i don't even know exactly how this was cut i well, mean i can imagine but um yeah. we don't have any evidence for that directly so it's kind of it's a weird phenomenon or the, you know it's yeah. a weird little historical uh treasure right there really neat piece yeah yeah, yeah. so okay let's what's on the next slide we, we've got lots of cool ones okay so as we move into the renaissance um, the technology, you know, this is what we're talking about in the article, the technology evolves and every time we see the technology evolve, the cutting style evolves. So whereas at first we just had like the, the table cut that we just saw in the, the, v, the V&A ring, now we're starting to see more complicated stuff. So on the left we've got uh, Hans Holbern, so he's a quite famous designer and jeweler from the court of Henry VIII you know, the Tudor period. And he was using a lot of those same simple cuts, like the, the step cut and the table cut. A lot of his work is is using really simple stones because that was what was in style at that time. And that was really, you know, it wasn't just the style, it was really the maximum kind of style that they could do with the, the simple technology they had. I mean, if you imagine just taking a gemstone on a stick with, with no other tool but that stick and trying to make a faceting pattern, it's very hard. I, tr I mean, people do it. It takes a long time to get good at it, mm -hmm. but it's very, very hard to, to do that. So once we start to see some technology come in and they have a way of controlling that stick a little bit better, we start to see more advanced stuff. And this ring on, or this pendant on the right, which is also in the V&A Museum, 
is a great early example of some of these um, multifaceted cuts or fancy cuts, as they're sometimes called. Uh, it's hard to see in this small photo, but this this you have to get the the article to ch check it out a little bit larger. But the top stone has a really interesting, almost like a early triangular pattern, and then the one on the bottom also has a bunch of triangles in the crown. Hmm. Both of them are very unusual, kind of. Uh, yeah, I guess like the last one, it's just unusual pieces that we were fortunate enough to still be able to see. Um, and one of my favorite things about this piece, it, the setting is open in the back. So it's intended that when you wear it, the stones are touching your skin because, of course, they really had this belief in the magical power of stones in the medieval and Renaissance mm -hmm. times. And so this was intended not only to be beautiful, but to, you know, adorn the wearer with some sort of divine power, you know, whether it be like a um, anti-poison or anti, um, you know, like fits, you know, they were constantly worried about having fits and, um, you know, having these sort of, uh, I don't know, like melancholy and stuff like that. So um, it's kind of fun to see, you know, you can read about these things, but it, there's not very, I haven't seen very many surviving pieces where the jeweler has intentionally put the stone in a way that it's meant to touch your skin mm -hmm. um, so that you're you're drawing upon the divine power of the stone all day. So it's kind mm -hmm. of fun. You know, it's kind of an outdated, you know, especially we have we have gemology today. We 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 kind of don't look at stones that way anymore, but it's kind of fun to see um, some historical pieces that were really, you know, in a in a magical kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. I like I like looking at that stuff. But the fasting pattern also really, really um groundbreaking in a way because it's it's something totally fresh. And it's something that didn't survive. Like we don't find either of these patterns that are in these two stones on the right. We don't I don't I've never seen documentation for for them at all. So these could be one offs, you know. And then we're gonna see more of that later when we get into the cheap side hoard, which was our cover image. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's on our next slide here? Okay, so we're seeing again the as we move forward in time, technology advances. So the gem cutting advances, and now that we're really getting into 16th century, 17th century, we're starting to see rose cuts. Um, and then in this bottom right picture, we're starting to see some other sort of I guess you just call them fancy cuts because they don't really have a name, but these um, in the drawing, the top row of the bottom drawing, the, the two on the right, they're kind of like rose cuts. I mean, they're intricate little triangles, but they're not really rose cuts. And they're in this sort of emerald cut octagon outline. I don't have a name for them at all. And outside of the Cheapside Horde, I've never seen any pattern like this. So mm. if these were cut in London, which they might have been because they these were part of the Cheapside Hoard, um, they, these could just be uh, the creation of one London cutter, you know, in the 1600s who mm. was experimenting. We have, we have no idea because we don't know the story of these stones from the Cheapside Hoard, you know, specifically who they belong to. So we can only really guess, but um, I, I love the cheap side hoard because there's so many unusual, like almost every stone of that in in the hoard is unusual. Like they're they're not the typical step cuts and and table cuts that we would expect to find. I mean, there's th those are there too, but rose cuts, um, modified rose cuts. You know, this one in the bottom left, which is like a six sided star. Another one that. I don't even know if it has a name. I've seen one like this in the uh, Ashmolean Museum. So that one's not a one-off, but some of those fancier ones with the octagon shape, those are really, really unusual. And I'm really looking forward to when the Cheapside Hoard goes back on um, display, like in a couple of years, whenever it's supposed to, because I've never been able to see these in real life. You know, they're in deep storage right now. And while I was doing the research, I got to go and talk to the curator um, Hazel Forsyth, who we, we reference a lot in this article, and she was she was incredibly um, kind with her time and her her research. She shared a lot of stuff with me that ended up going into the article that she's never published. So that was really cool. But unfortunately, she wasn't able to pull any of the pieces out because they're they're mm. in the process of being moved into this. You know, mm. I don't know. They're building a new museum somewhere, sometime, and 
and you can't, I don't know, they're not, they're not accessible. So even with the backstage access, you can't, you can't get them right now. So mm. we, all we have is these photos and these drawings that I made. So, and then, I okay, so. Have, next, I think we have some examples of some of the jewels on the next slide too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we get into the 1500s, the big technological or the big, the big aesthetic advance was the rose cut. So the rose cut starts in diamonds, but quickly comes into the colored stone world. And the the ring on the left is is a great example. It's I think it's Czech garnets um, that are in the rose cut style, which has become the almost the symbol of Czech garnets. You know, today when you buy Czech garnets, they're always cut this way, which makes me assume that these would be as well. Um, they, they were really the ones that kicked off the technological revolution that allowed you know modern cutters to have hand pieces and you know some of these advancements that we're going to see in a few more slides but so yeah we we got the rose cut on the left and then in the middle we have another um kind of unusual set of cuts again um very particular to the cheap side hoard these sort of square i'm calling them square rose cuts because I, I don't know what else to call them it's a rose cut and usually rose cuts are round right they look like sort of a flower, sort mm -hmm. of, right? But these ones, they're, they're rectangles, but they have that same triangular interlocking pattern that we we don't really see anywhere else, even today, that that's not a normal pattern. Um, so that one's really interesting. And then of course, the I, I think maybe, this is one of my favorites, I think this is everyone's favorite from the Cheap Side Hoard. It's one of the most phenomenal pieces, this emerald watch. So that's on the right, and it's it's one giant emerald that's been hollowed out, and and we're seeing it closed right now, but the top opens, and mm -hmm. there's a watch inside, like a pocket. It's a pocket watch basically, but it's the world's most <laughs> a beautiful and expensive pocket watch probably. It you know it's a, it's a big that that one I think I have seen in real life, and it's huge. You know it's it's not huge, but for an emerald watch, it's it's incredible. So. Which is also a challenge for the cutting because you have such large surfaces there that need to be flat and polished. Yeah, yeah. And, and for anybody who watches this and who's a gem cutter, you'll know making, you know, the bigger the facet, the harder it is to polish and making it flat with, with you know, especially with crude technology is really hard. You know, most of the time when I look at old stones, they're not, you know, they're they're they have a a little bit of a ripple or a wave in in the facets because the, you know, they're just holding them, right? And mm -hmm. a piece like this, you would imagine the cutter's just just holding it in his hand, like it's too big to go on a stick, probably. I mean, I'm just guessing, but I, I would imagine if I was going to do something like this, you'd start with it handheld because it's so big. Mm -hmm. But you can see from, especially when you look up in the in the close-up photos the the faceting the facets are are really flat and i'm very impressed with this piece i mean aside from the fact that they've drilled out an emerald without breaking it that's nerve-wracking in itself i mean emerald is one of the most delicate stones for the gem cutter because they're so easy to break mm -hmm. you know here in thailand i'm i'm coming to you from bangkok here in thailand um you know only certain factories can even do emeralds because they they're just so delicate and the the lapidaries here you know they're used to rubies and sapphires so sometimes if they're not used to emeralds it, it's easy to break them like they're they're a delicate stone so if someone asked me to do this i i'm not sure i would accept the job because j doing the drill hole by itself i i can't imagine doing it i mean it's mm -hmm. I don't know what they would have used if you know because you just imagine like scooping it out the way you do with wood but of course that doesn't work on a mm -hmm. on a hard stone you know mm -hmm. barrels pretty hard and and if i imagine modern drilling tools that might be so shocking to the emerald that it would possibly break it mm -hmm. anyway so I, i'm curious as to how they did that um mm -hmm. it's amazing you know it, it's amazing to look at stuff that's four or five six hundred years old and still be, you know, kind of scratching your head, like, how did they do that? Mm -hmm. Kind of like looking at the pyramid, you're like, how did they do that? And when mm -hmm. I look at this watch, I'm just like, we can guess, you know, we can make a good guess, but nobody ever wrote down, you know, how did they, how did they do that? So we can only, we're not totally sure, but it's beautiful one way or the other. Definitely, yeah. And, and so, 
when we finally are able to get a glimpse into the technology, it's it's pretty far on. I mean, the first ring that we saw was from the thir late 1300s. By the time we see a faceting machine here, this one on the left, we're already in the end of the 1600s. So, you know, we're, we're the, our first image of a of a gem cutting machine is already 300 years into the story. And if we think about the Staffordshire hoard, we're we're like I don't know, seven, eight, almost almost a century later. So we were really far into this, the narrative at this point, but this is really the oldest picture that I've ever come across. And this is directly thanks to seeing, you know, meeting with Hazel at the Museum of London. She told me about this manuscript that she had come across with this uh, old drawing from, what does it say, 1688 yeah. of this, you know, you can see there's a hand crank um, machine. You got the hand crank on the left, and then the right side looks a little bit confusing, but it's basically just a piece of metal. It's a metal L-shaped rod to hold the, the lapidary's wheel that spins around while he's cranking. And then you can see the, the, the basically the gears underneath the table. It's just a big, two big wooden wheels that turn like, basically like a bicycle. It's not mm -hmm. any more complicated than a bicycle gear. Um, and so they would just turn that crank and uh, and they would freehand the stone, uh, as far as we know. And then picture B is the what what he calls the lapidary sandbox, which I had, I had actually never heard about that until this manuscript. But after I saw it, I discovered later, and I'm not sure if this picture is in the PowerPoint, but there's some other photos that I have from the 1900s, and, and gem cutters in London still had the same exact same design of their sandbox, which was just basically. Um, where they would put the stones to cool down once they'd taken them out of the wax. You know, they have to heat them up to take the wax off and they drop them in there just to pull the heat out. Or sometimes those sandboxes might have their abrasive powder inside or, or maybe both. They drop it into the powder to just cool it off. Mm -hmm. But so some of the other pictures that we're seeing here, these are in the article and we're just looking at other, um, other old gem cutting machines from Germany in the top right and then in the bottom right is a old you know the an early diamond what we think is a diamond cutting machine it looks a lot like other images i've seen of diamond cutting mills in the in the period and so what we're trying to talk about in in this is that you know the story of diamond cutting in london and the story of color stone cutting were already two separate narratives with two separate types of technology and, and in the same book we find two different types of machines so kind mm -hmm. of interesting we don't really have a a source that we can pinpoint when did those two things split but we can see already in in the 1680s that, that they, they were definitely already two different lineages and today when you know when we talk to colored stone cutters they don't really know anything about diamond cutting and diamond cutters don't really ever know anything about colored stone cutter, mm -hmm. cutting even though it's not that different but the 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 traditions have always been separate um same as like a goldsmith wouldn't know anything about cutting a stone either unless they had trained that way mm -hmm. so it's just you know different uh different job so but yeah we're getting some idea about how are these early cutters cutting and then as we move on in the powerpoint i think we're going to see later even some more so yeah, here we can see, um, so in the bottom right, there's a trade card from a gem cutter in the 1700s. And he's using, we can see his little picture at the top. I love this this thing. This, this trade card's funny because it, it's British, but it's actually in a museum in America because this um, cutter, Moses Hyams, he actually, uh, after he retired, he he moved to the New World and he retired in, I think it's Virginia. And so mm -hmm. his trade card ended up somehow going into this library um, that's there. And so so we have a little bit of British gem cutting history even going into America. So, but we mm -hmm. see he's using the same machine, even though he's about 100 years later, he's using the same machine that we saw in the last slide. And then we can start to see in the picture in the top right, the evolution of the cutting styles. You know, we're, we're getting into the brilliant cut and what we call today the old mine cut. And then again, we still see the rose cut on the right. And then in on the left, we've got a picture of an engraver, which is something that I only talk about really briefly 
in the article, but we, you know, London definitely had a history of engraving. And I think you'll, you'll see the picture better if you look in the article, but we have this very classic gentleman in his, you know, sort of, eight, I think it's 18th century attire um, with this very complicated sort of, um, it's a lathe for, for all intents and purposes. It's a, it's a gemstone lathe that he's using or like a rose engine that he's using to engrave his gemstones. And so there's a little anecdote in the article about how he was, you know, doing these demos for like a, a shilling or something like that um, and watch him do his, his trick basically. And I think there's only, I think there's only one more slide next, right? Talk about the hand pieces. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is one thing I think that the whole time, you know, from that early picture that we saw, even though that early picture didn't show the handpiece, I think that London cutters were using this handpiece on the left because we know for sure that in Prague, where they really, they really, um, they really pioneered this handpiece and they, they, they were using it for the check cutting industry for garnets. Everywhere that we see this hand crank machine in, in Paris, in Prague, and later on in London, we see this handpiece. So I think that they were using the handpiece already as well. He just mm -hmm. didn't show it. But it's it's thanks to the handpiece that we're able to see these rose cuts and later on the brilliant cuts. Because like, again, just holding a stick in your hand, is it's it wouldn't mm -hmm. be possible to make a brilliant cut that way. It's too hard mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. some kind of leverage device. And so this was the early one. And then... This was, I wanted to kind of, you know, in some subtle way, I wanted to give the article a kind of a cliffhanger ending, you know, kind of a Game of Thrones end because, you know, it's only part one. So the story will pick up in the next issue when it comes out and we'll see how the, um, the quadrant handpiece that was used all over Europe for a couple of hundred years, um, it gets, uh, it gets, eliminated it, it, you know the, a new technology comes in in the early 1800s that we're going to see in the next article and um you know we've got these two versions of the london um quadrant handpiece and then after probably the beginning of the 1800s i mean these are both from the 1830s but i think even at that point these were already on their way they, they were almost gone um by the 1820s and then we start to see new technology come in I won't I won't reveal it yet because I want to keep the uh, cliffhanger going. But maybe if anybody knows if 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 anybody knows some gem cutters in London today, you maybe know what it's going to be. But so this is kind of like the last generation technology before we get into the modern day. And so the part two article will be starting with John Ma in the 1800s and looking at how kind of the modern the modern story started. You know the it's kind of the birth of modern gemology. We've got the birth of Gem A, and then um, this first generation of sort of um, gemologist gem cutters. And that was a thing that really started in London. So, you know, as I went through the research and, and put through this story together, I got to, you know, for my own personal journey of writing it, I really got to see all these milestone moments, you know, like the, the birth of Gem A and the first generation of gemologist gem cutters are directly tied in, you know, the people that started gem A, the forefathers were, were directly in communication with some of these gem cutters that we talk about in this part two, in the part two uh, articles. So it's really cool to see how it still exists. Cause of course now we're, you know, you know I, I was really proud to be able to publish this in the journal of gemology because it, you know, obviously it's in London, but there's a direct, Hi to 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 the Gemological Institute of of Great Britain. So it's just so cool to see how it's all still going. And you know, and, and as we see the new technology that comes in, you know, and then you'll see in the article that there are still cutters today that are still using that same hand crank machine. Mm -hmm. And I got to go visit them and spend a month with them. You know, just documenting their techniques because they're the last ones to do it. There are no more. In London, at least, there's one studio in Ipswich that still cuts that way and actually has some apprentices. But in London, um, there are no more. I mean, there's only these two 70 plus years old guys that still cut this way. 
and um, you know they're like a sort of a living museum at this point. I mean, they're not. They're uh, they're just gem cutters, that, and you know they they don't even really like visitors that much. But <laughs> for me to go in there, it's like going into his uh, you know a reenactment his historical ex mm. exhibit because they're still cutting the same way that people were cutting in the 1820s and the 1880s, and you know they and they're just a product of the the apprenticeship lineage that you know we can trace all the way back through this article so so cool to see that for me you know obviously maybe you can tell that i'm just completely obsessed with this this story of gem cutting but to be able to lay it out in such a chronological way and then see how it still connects to today it's not just a dead story it's yeah you know, barely still alive, but it, it is still alive. And for me, it's so inspiring to see, as a gem cutter myself, to see where does it come from? Where do some of these techniques come from? You know, even as an American cutter, some of this stuff from America, of course, goes back, um, all of it goes back to Europe in some way. So I, I feel like when I meet these old gem cutters from London or looking at some of these drawings that we've seen here, I'm seeing my own roots. And mm. it's, for me, it's completely, it, inspiring to see myself in a different way as part of this you know as part of the next generation of this story so so cool and I, brendan i have to thank you for letting me do this you know a two-part article i didn't know if you were gonna agree to that because it's a little bit unusual i think i do do you do many two-part articles in the journal of well Geology? not not actually this is the first one since i've been on board um we we had part one of another article on pearls but unfortunately, part two never came in. So, um, and that's why, in in your case, when you um, proposed the idea, we said, okay, well, let's let's have both parts submitted together, <laughs> so we know we know we've got part one and part two. Yeah, um, but part. No, with all the research you've assembled, it would have been impossible to do all this in one issue and still have room for other content. And so, yeah. it's just wonderful that you've that you've gone in and, and taken the deep dive to to find the level of detail and. In your research and really bring all this history to life and relate it to the present day it's it's really a neat project so well i, I really I, I gotta give a shout out again to the society of antiquaries of london like they they i met those two old cutters in london uh like a year before the project started and i i came back to bangkok and i was like i have to go back to london as soon as possible like these two guys their story is so cool and you know they're old so you, you just don't know i don't know if they're going to retire soon you know they've they've already had health issues and then you know we didn't know about covid yet so um they're still there but you know i was just like i must find a way to get back as soon as possible and i it was like the week before Christmas and I just typed in like London research grant. The first one that came up was this one. I wow. applied to it like five days before the deadline. And, you know, five months later, I found out that I got it and I got the full amount that I asked for. And Fantastic. it was just yeah. like, okay, I can go back. Like, you know, six months later, I got to go back. So it's so cool. And, cool. and I didn't have to wor worry about financial stress. I was just like, I'm in London. I have an Airbnb. I'm going to the museums every day, the the library every day, and then I was sort of doing this improvised mini apprenticeship with these two guys in Hatton Garden and just like bringing my video camera in and videotaping them and asking them all these questions and right, you know, I recorded everything that we said because I was just like, you know, we have to record these two guys. They're the last ones. And then, and then later I found out this, there was another guy in Ipswich. So there's three, three old men who still know the ancient handed down, you know, lineage from the apprenticeship that they did in the 70s. So, so cool, so inspiring. And and I'm, I hope that people that get the uh, article through the magazine um, enjoy it. You know, it's, it's always, I think, you know, I don't know if you have this experience since you're the editor, but for me as a, as a person who's putting out a lot of videos and a lot of articles and stuff on social media, the, it's it's a little bit mysterious to do the magazine because you don't get direct feedback. Like I have no idea how people are reacting or it, 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 I don't know if they're reading the article and I don't know if they like it because, you know, there's no like button. There's no comments. <laughs> you just publish it and you're just like, OK, it's it's out there. It's a totally different experience than. Yeah. This, this has been this has been I've been editing, you know, gemological journals now for 
20 plus years, and this has always been my experience too, is actually no news is good news when it comes to this because generally when you get a response it's usually somebody writing a letter saying you've got this all wrong or here's something yeah. you know you didn't you didn't get right but when you don't get a letter well, that usually means that everything's good and you know you did a good job <laughs> so you can yeah. if you find any solace in that you can know that that's a, a it's a good thing not getting a lot of comments when it comes to journal publishing yeah, okay. but, uh, no, but that we're, we're we feel very privileged that you're sharing this research with us and that uh, you've You've done so much of this behind the scenes work. And uh, so we're, we're grateful that you're sharing that with our readers. And and uh, I should also mention that I, I just learned today from you that you prepared a little YouTube video that kind of introduces this article that you've just put online recently. So yeah, we'll, I uh, thought, we'll put a, yeah. Oh, I thought, you know, um, if you do a movie or something, you make a trailer, right? So I was like, okay, a trailer for an article, it's a bit, eccentric but you know for me i spent like two years really doing this article it's so it took so long because there's so much stuff and then we we should i don't know if we have time but we should talk for a moment just about the rigors of peer review because man this this article kicked my butt in the peer review you know <laughs> like you write you know for me i you write this whole long it's 30 page article between the two parts at least on on my computer and so you spend so long doing this and I send it to you and I'm just like okay fingers crossed that he's even going to accept it and then it comes back later with the peer review and you're just like my soul has been destroyed <laughs> but you know and then and then you you see all the red ink basically it's like getting a paperback from your teacher and be like nope this was wrong this was wrong this is too long you know blah 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 and then you have to rewrite the whole thing and then maybe you have to do it again but finally what we printed to me is awesome because it's so it's so much more um, concise than the original thing that I sent you. Yeah, I mean it's chiseled, it's yeah. streamlined, it's not rambling anymore. And it, you know, I learned so much through the through the editorial process of this. It's so, yeah. so I almost I feel like if anyone speaks to me about this article, I have to give a shout out to you and the peer review team because this article, you know, like I wrote it, but you guys really cut the fat off and it made it what I, you know to me it's great i i love what we've made together and uh i can't i could not have it would not be this good without you and the uh, the peer reviewers well thank so. you thanks for thanks for your stamina and going through through it all too yeah and well, COVID happened at the same time yeah so. that's right <laughs> Well, we um, we should move on to discuss some more of the issue. And Justin, you're you're more than welcome to stay on and and uh, if you like. I know it's late in Bangkok, but uh, be pleased no, to have you stay on here. So um, the next article in the issue is this discussion about um, this interesting patchy blue and green coloration in Dominican blue amber. For those of you who don't know what blue amber is, um, some amber from certain localities in the world has an interesting blue tone to it or a blue hue when it's exposed to UV component, whether that's uh, in daylight or actually uh, UV light. And these are a couple examples here um, from the Dominican Republic showing this blue, blue appearance. Uh, these don't show the interesting appearance that the authors are talking about in the article. So we'll get to that in just a minute. So on the next slide, we'll see uh, the mining, where the material comes from in the Dominican Republic. These are really small mines, mined by local people in shallow pits. They may go down to 10 meters or so. Um, dug down in some sediments, and they just look through the material to, to pull out the amber. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see an example of some of these uh, pieces that the authors studied. And um, so what, what the amber looks like, as you can see on the far left, these are two different pear-shaped samples shown in a variety of different uh, lightings. And um, with a white background under, under standard daylight, they look like normal amber with, uh, in this case, lots of dark inclusions. Um, but when you expose them, when you, when you have them on the same light, but you have them over a black background, interestingly enough, then you see this fluorescence come through much more. And so you'll see here that you get this patchy sort of yellow colors of the amber mixed with some more green and more, some more blue. And then uh, in the UV light in the, in the center and then on the right are some other slices taken from these pieces, you can see that they're mainly fluorescing blue with some weaker areas. Um, and those those weaker areas are what are corresponding to the green patchy fluorescence in these pieces, as the authors very effectively show a little later on. So on the next slide, 
um, the internal features were documented very carefully because there is there was some concern in the trade that this patchy fluorescence coloration might reflect the fact that they were reconstructed. And as um, anyone knows who's dealt with amber for any period of time, you can take small pieces of amber and actually press them together and make what's called you know pressed or reconstructed amber. And this could cause confusion. This this texture that I'm or this uh, color appearance could cause confusion with this type of, of reconstructed amber. So what we see here are some internal features that the authors made of the Dominican Republic material in slides A, B, C, D, and E. And then on the lower right photo on slide, slide F, that's a piece of reconstructed amber. And the bright colors in the lower photos are all due to the fact that these are taken in cross polars. So these are interference colors that you're seeing. And that really exposes the structure, whereas you see swirl patterns and sort of these intricate, um, um, disordered patterns in the Dominican Republic amber. And the one on the lower right, which has been reconstructed, it's more of a mosaic sort of distinct shapes that are pressed together as you would expect if small pieces were brought together. So clearly this amber with this patchy fluorescence is not reconstructed. Uh, next slide. So um, in looking at the, the, the origin of the patchy green color, um, what the authors did is, first of all, just took a standard transmittance spectrum of the, the amber, and there's the yellow color on the left that corresponds with that spectrum. And then they did some fluorescence emission spectrum with long wave uh, UV uh, excitation. And in the areas that had the, the more blue fluorescence, you had some, some, a different fluorescence spectrum than you did with the more greenish areas. And um, also there's a, there was a much lower intensity. You can't really read the, um, the y-axis labels on these spectra, but be, due to the lower intensity of the fluorescence overall, you, what you have is a superposition of the, um, the blue fluorescence with the yellow body color, and that's what makes the green color appearance of this amber. So on the next slide then, we'll see uh, an example of some of the, the chemical zonations. The authors did some SEM work and looked at the, you, you can really only detect carbon and oxygen um, in amber with the SEM. And they found some, some local variations which show, um, correspond they think to um, differences in maturity of the amber. And this was proven in the next slide where they did the infrared spectra of the blue areas versus the green areas. And there's two peaks in particular at 1642 and 888 that correspond with the maturity level of amber. And by maturity, what we mean is um, over time, over geologic time, the resin that, that originally formed the amber is polymerized and the, the volatiles are lost through um, burial in the geologic environment. And um, so that's, the, the more this happens, the longer this happens, the more mature the material is. And so, the smaller peaks, the smaller the peaks at 1642 and 888, um, that means the more mature they are. So the blue fluorescing areas, the areas that were the stronger blue fluorescing, were actually slightly more mature than the green fluorescing areas. This doesn't mean that all the resin didn't come out at the same time, but what it means is that the original resin that formed this amber, the green areas, probably had more volatiles or were somehow chemically a little bit different and that they devolatilize more slowly than the blue amber, and that's what made um, the, this patchy, interesting patchy green fluorescence. So a real nice story um, by these Chinese authors who did a lot of detailed work on these amber specimens. Uh, so we'll go on to the next article now. Um, this is a really neat article, uh, something that we don't hear very much about, and that is um, gem liberation from the host rocks. So, in this case, in the Kaja mine in Zambia, you've got beautiful emeralds that come out of a biotite schist. And as you can see in the photo on the left, you need some way to, to remove the emeralds from the host schist so that you can then proceed with your, your um, evaluating the material for cutting and sorting and things. And um, this is typically done through a cobbing process by hand with just a, a simple cobbing hammer by knocking the, the biotite schist and the quartz and things like that the gang material, as you call it, off of uh, the emerald and then leaving the emerald pieces um, there, which you can imagine is a very labor intensive pro prospect when you have a whole pile of these things that you need to extract. So what the authors are looking at is a, a technique that's actually been used in ore processing 
of a variety of other um, mining techniques or mining applications like for gold and silver and, and precious metals and and even um, this has been used for some gemstones like a demantoid in Russia and it's using what's called pulse power disaggregation or electric pulse disaggregation which is passing very high voltage through the material while it's immersed in a water bath to break it up you know, along its grain boundaries, pre-existing grain boundaries. So the next slide, we'll see what the instrumentation they installed at the Kajem mine. This is in 2019, and um, it's called the Spark 2 device. Um, what it consists of is a very high voltage generator that, that creates pulses of electricity through um, the, this apparatus on the lower left. Um, and it's called a Marx generator. And, and then the, the, the photo on the lower sort of middle shows um, a water tank that has the samples in it. And then the, the current that's passed through that um, it enters on the top. And then those sieves on the right are what the samples sit in. And then as they break up, when these pulses are entered, the pieces drop through the sieves and you can easily have them sized and they fall right into plastic bags, which is really, really handy. Um, next slide shows the results of this um, processing, or first of all, the sample materials that were used. The ones on the left were subjected to this new um, EPD technique. The ones on the right were hand cobbed for comparison. And then on the right, or the on the next slide is the result of the two different techniques compared side by side. Um, so next slide, we'll see the samples after the, they've been processed. The ones on the left again for the EPD and the ones on the right through hand cobbing. Both techniques ended up producing approximately the same amount of, of rough material, but the ones on the right, as you can see, they they're, have a little bit more of the host rock material um, adhering to them still. The ones on the left are a little bit cleaner. Um, also, um, the time was much faster. It was about 9.5 minutes to process the batch on the right, whereas about 17 minutes, as I recall, to process the batch on the on the on the right, sorry, the, and the batch on the left with the EPD was only 9.5, so about half the amount of time through this technique. So um, this has been used uh, since 2019 to process all the ore at the Kajem mine, and as we can see from this example, it's a, a very efficient way of doing so, and we'll probably see a widespread, more widespread use of this technique in the future to other gem materials. So we'll go on to the next article now. Um, cobalt blue spinel from northern Pakistan really need to uh, uh, look at, at a new deposit producing cobalt blue spinel with beautiful colors as you can see still rather included this place um, has only been known since 2019 and has been mined on a small scale so so far we have rather included material but uh, it remains to be seen what's going to be produced in the future but on the next slide um, the authors did a really thorough study of the coloration causes of this material, um, and they, they studied a variety of samples that they obtained by personally visiting the locality um, a couple of years ago. And it's this is in a very remote area of northern Pakistan. Um, the mountain on the far skyline in the cloud, that's Rakaposhi, which is nearly 8,000 meters. So this is just a really tough area to work. Um, the Shisbar Valley, which is on the right, which kind of takes off to the right behind the photo, that's where this new deposit is located. And the next slide, we'll see the samples that were used for the characterization of the study, falling into three main groups with the brightly blue colored material in the center. You have dark blue on the right, and then more of a purplish blue, dark purplish blue on the left. And on the next slide, we'll see how these samples differed um, chemically or inclusion wise. First of all, um, they had some interesting inclusions that we don't normally see in spinel, and these are seen on kind of the upper left where you get this checkerboard appearance, where, which is kind of this iridescent zones that form. Those are not related to the faceting of the pieces. In fact, most of the materials that were studied were just simply rough pieces that they polished faces on so that they could get a good look inside. And uh, these checkerboard shapes are, are probably coming from microcrystalline rutile that is arranged in certain domains. And we can see some of those on the upper right slide, that, that kind of hazy looking appearance caused by these rutile inclusions. Um, and it's just sort of unusual because there's only one other deposit in Tanzania that produces inclusions similar to this in spinel, and that's not even cobalt bearing. So this is pretty, pretty unique. 
On the next slide, um, we'll go into more of the chemical features, uh, the, the UV vis features that result or that, that correspond to these three colors. And in general, what's happening here is you've got a series of absorption peaks related to cobalt that are causing the blue coloration. And these are most intensely defined in that bright blue uh, material. And then as you get higher iron contents, you get the darker blue, which you still have a lot of cobalt in the material, but the iron sort of swamps or overwhelms the effect of the cobalt blue, and it brings up the overall absorption, causing that darker color appearance. And then finally, for the violet blue material, you actually have a little bit of chromium coming in and that that influence of chromium is causing that departure from a blue to more of a violet color. And in the next slide, we'll see the uh, chemical composition. So the interesting thing about cobalt spin spinel, um, besides its beautiful color, is the fact that there is no real formal definition for what you call a cobalt blue spinel. And the authors were kind of looking at where do you draw the boundaries, you know, can you draw the boundaries chemically between these three varieties that they studied. And actually there was some beautiful clustering of the, the chemical data with the most cobalt, least chromium, and least iron-rich compositions corresponding in the lower right of that triangle to the bright blue material. And then the, the higher iron being the darker, the higher chromium being the, the more violet color material and towards the other apexes. And then when they plotted the ratios of these elements, this was where it was really clever to me to see how the cluster on the lower left, which corresponds to that bright blue material, that has uh, specific ratios of cobalt to um, the chromium and the, and the, and the uh, uh, iron. And in the case of iron, when you have iron over cobalt less than 110, you get that beautiful blue color. And then when you have chromium over cobalt, less than four, you get that color. So for at least these particular samples, this provides an interesting way of categorizing what you might consider cobalt spinel from a chemical way. And it would be really neat to then apply this chemical data to other cobalt spinel localities to see if you get the similar trends breaking out. So, But uh, we'll move on now to some gem notes that appeared in this issue. And uh, the first of which is a couple of really unusual stones. Uh, most people have never even heard of star iolite, but here we have two different examples from the collection of Martin Steinbeck that were characterized uh, to look at the, the cause of the asterism in these stones. And so on the left, we have a, a seven carat stone, which has some fairly decent transparency. On the right, uh, nearly 200 carat stone, which was more opaque, but just amazing for its size. When you look um, at the side of these stones, in addition to the beautiful star you get when when you've been viewed faced up, you get a, a chatoyant band that goes all the way around the girdle when you look at the side, as you can see in the photo on the lower right. In the next slide, then, we'll see um, the inclusions that cause the um, chatoyancy and the asterism. These were identified as hematite by Ramon spectroscopy, and it's a series of oriented platelets and little tiny acicular inclusions, which were also oriented in, in three directions at 60 degrees to one another. And that's what's responsible for the asterism, in addition to kind of a general sheen. And then the photo on the right shows the sort of vertical orientation of, of a lot of these little acicular inclusions. And that's what corresponds to that chatoyant band that goes around the, the uh, girdle of the stones. So a real nice study to illuminate what's happening with the or a phenomenal appearance of these stones. On the next slide, we'll uh, look at another interesting gem note. This is a a really neat uh, garnet occurrence from Tanzania. We don't normally see such such strongly color zone garnets. It, it almost looks like a tourmaline when you look at the stone on the lower left. But these stones um, came out of Tanzania a couple of years ago, and they all came from one parcel. And it's grossular, but of course, when grossular is a beautiful green color, we call it savorite. And so you might think of these as sort of a sa bicolor savorite or bicolor grossular savorite. And um, Regardless of whether the, the regardless of the coloration, the Ramon spectra show that the, all the stone is grossular with very little variation. Um, when we, the authors are going to look at this this material in more detail in the future for probably a full article to be published in the future. But uh, for the time being, we just wanted to bring this this material to the reader's attention because its color zoning is really neat. On the next slide, we've got another gem note pertaining to this purple spinel from Afghanistan. And you may recall back in 2019, there was a, a gem note on this material 
um, when it first came out, just announcing that it's from a new deposit in Badakhshan in Afghanistan. And in this case, the authors uh, took a closer look at a nice parcel of material, studied the inclusions in detail, and also look at some of the, the chemistries. We can see in the next slide, the inclusions are quite varied, um, mostly consisting of rutile. Um, and, and the rutile forms in, in several different sort of appearances from isolated or semi-isolated clusters and, and different um, shaped crystals. The, the crystal in the center, that, that interesting wedge-shaped crystal, seems to be potentially indicative of material from this deposit because you don't see rutile with this morphology in, in other deposits very often. You also get apatite, zircon, and probably most commonly, um, in addition to rutile, you get mica crystals forming in this uh, badakshan uh, material. Next slide is uh, looking at the UV vis spectra. The um, coloration of this material is just due to iron. Um, in this case, both iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. And when you look at the chemical composition as seen on the right there, iron with no surprise is by far the highest trace element. And you also have a significant amount of zinc and, and some other trace elements occurring in this interesting spinel. On the next slide, so we uh, are going to look at a diamond uh, with this fascinating, it's a greenish yellow color. Um, typically, um, when, when diamonds have radiation stains, like you see on the right on the girdle of the stone, they're usually green or brown. If, if they're green, that's typically um, as they've been formed from exposure to natural radiation in the earth. Um, and then when they are heated, either naturally or in the lab, they can the, the green radiation stains will turn brown. And typically, these radiation stains are used as an indicator of natural color in diamond. Um, in this case, the authors documented a very unusual example of a diamond that's treated, but that still shows these radiation stains. And um, you might wonder, well, how do they know it was treated? Well, the next slide shows some detailed spectroscopy that they did. Um, the diamond on the FTR spectrum was determined as being this type 1A AB. So it's a type 1 diamond, but um, it displayed a couple of peaks which were very indicative, and that is on the right, right-hand spectrum, the two right-hand peaks are the H3 and the H4 peaks. And because the H4 peak is uh, in greater abundance than the H3 peak, this has been shown to be conclusive evidence of treatment. And in addition, there were some other radiation-related peaks that showed this diamond was treated. So we know the diamond was irradiated, and then based on the fact that the um, radiation stain is now brown and not green, we also know that it's been heated above a certain amount. So a neat contribution there from the SSCF lab on, on a, uh, just a, sort of a beware saying, just because you see a stone that has these radiation stains doesn't mean that it hasn't been treated. And then the last gem note we're going to discuss is um, actually kind of an instrument review of, of this neat new portable um, spectrometer that you can actually hook to your cell phone and use it to take absorption spectrum spectra of stones and as well as a variety of other materials made by this company called Go Spectro. So um, the device is shown on the upper right of the cell phone and then here it's connected to a fiber optic cable which is an optional accessory that makes it much easier to collect the um, spectral data from a stone which here is a, a, a illuminated by a fiber optic uh, array. So on the next uh, next slide, we'll see some examples of spectra that are generated from this. In this case, a series of pink to red stones that all show uh, unique spectra. Um, and in each screen um, that, that this is taken from screenshots from uh, the mobile app, you'll see on the top there's a standard absorption spectra. And then at the bottom is the graphical representation of the spectra in transition mode. So it does take a little use getting to getting used to where you're, we're used to seeing the spectra in absorption um, where the peaks are shown corresponding to absorption. In this case, it's the troughs in the spectra that correspond with the absorption since we're viewing them in transition mode. On the next slide, we'll see um, the, the importance of looking at the light source first with, the, with your spectra to check for any artifacts. And in this case, um, some of the artifacts were shown to overlap with features in the zircon spectrum. So it's really important to take a spectrum of your light source first and then keep that in mind while you're looking at your, um, at your unknown stone to make sure that you keep in mind where those absorption spectra artifacts might occur. 
And then the app also allows you to do some clever things like look at overlay the spectra and um, you can label the peaks and, and take a closer look at the spectra you generated. So, so in a K, that's, um, that's it for our, our review of this issue. Um, just as for those of you who aren't already members, um, this is just a quick little note on how to access the journal. You can become a member to receive printed copies and online access, including the most recent two years. And then anyone, even regardless if you're not a member, can go on and freely download issues that are more than 2000 or more than two years old from 1947 all the way through 2018. And that's on the archive section of the journal's website. Um, we also have a searchable index and subject bibliographies that you can freely download. And there's a data depository on the website which has additional photos and data and video clips that authors make available to accompany their articles in case you want to dive deeper into the content. So with that, uh, we close this webinar and I uh, want to thank you very much for, for tuning in. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to sub submit those to the chat function. Um, and also, Justin, I wanted to thank you for staying on with us considering how late it is. I did want to mention that um, you do have a new book coming out, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, too. It's true. Uh, actually, we're just getting ready to ship them probably in two days, the first batch going out. Um, so it's called The Secret Teachings of Gem Cutting. It looks like this. So. Oh, but except for it's, this is a mirror, I think. But um, no, it looks good on my screen. So okay, on mine it's a mirror. Okay. But basically, basically the idea, you know, especially since we're just talking about the, you know, the traditional cutting of London, what I wanted to do with the book was look at all of the traditional cutting techniques that we see in the trade today. I mean, the not the techniques, but the actual cutting styles. You know, everybody knows like the round, brilliant, and the oval you know mix cut but i wanted to look at all the ones that we use and then actually record them that you know there's the book is full of diagrams so if you're a gem cutter you can actually reproduce them but if you're a jeweler so we're as we're designing this we're like well what about jewelers you know would they would they be into this because um obviously the jeweler is not gonna need this kind of technical data for cutting but there's a there's a full photo and historical notes and cutting notes for each one. So it's kind of a cool, um, let's say, uh, visual style guide. You know, like if you had to sh try to figure out what your customer wants as far as design or shape or whatever, this could be a little bit of a, a guidebook. And then the first, the first section of the book is like a crash course on kind of like where gemology meets gem cutting. So even if you're not a gem cutter, that part's pretty cool. How, you know, talking about how do we look at rough? How do we orient rough to get the best color? How do we cut troublesome stones like the tourmaline with the black sea axis? Or, um, you know, what, what do we do in the case of like, for instance, a tanzanite where you have three different colors on three different axes and you need to try to balance those in some way that's still beautiful and and you know also maintaining weight so it, it you know this is kind of my covid project you know since we did we closed the school we have a cutting school here we closed the school at the beginning of the last year and so i just started cutting all these reference samples for a new class i'm working on and i was like once the samples were done i was like there's a book in here you know it, well, i've got all these designs and i've got all these reference samples and you know, we've got all these customer stones that are coming through all the time. So we just started taking photos and putting the diagrams together and, and it's been great. So we did a Kickstarter for it this year and that now it's finally published and ready to go. So hot off the we... press. Well, that's congratulations. And we will be reviewing that book in a, in a future issue of the journal. And yeah, that'll be yes. exciting. Yeah, fantastic. I have a couple of questions that came in for you. Um, one is, can you also explain how they were creating lapidary discs to be used in these machines? That probably is another difficult thing. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's something that I've been, I, I've been wanting to experiment a little bit, especially when we're looking at like that first image we saw of the garnets. You know, some of the really early medieval stuff, we, we actually do have documentation, not from the UK, but from other places in Europe of like, 
what materials they were using, what, you know, what kind of metals, how they were, um, what kind of abrasives they were using. They don't ever speak about how they made them, but I've been looking at like, you know, blacksmithing techniques and other metalsmithing techniques of, of you know, like how are they casting swords? You know, they were probably casting copper um, discs in the same way. You know, you have a mold, whether that be sand or I'm not sure what, how else, but I'm guessing it's like a sand casting. You dump your hot uh, metal in there and then you've got a mold, which is actually still how we make laps today. They, they mold them, but then they, now today they take them onto a lathe and they flatten them out. And that's the part, I'm not totally sure how they would have done that. I've been trying to find somebody who's like a, you know, a, a blacksmith who does like historical, mm -hmm. like, like Renaissance fair type, you know, uh, demonstrations that might know how would you make, uh, you know, like like a, a knife sharpener, because that's something that they would still be able to make, you know, this sort of hand crank sharpener. Mm -hmm. How would you make that? That's probably exactly the same. I'm not totally sure, but I, I want to find out because I actually want to try and, you know, looking at that first ring that we saw with the table cut, I want to recreate it and see if I can cut it in the medieval style and see if, you know, that'd be a kind of a cool experimental archaeology type thing. But I haven't, you know, be, being in Bangkok, it's a little bit hard because all those people that I would like to collaborate with are not here. So I have to like find ways to get to either America or Europe to find like a blacksmith that can fabricate me some some stuff that I need but it could be kind of a maybe that's a gem note for the future you know how did they yeah yeah actually I know a blacksmith here locally if, if I can be of any help let me know so so yeah when I come to America next time maybe we can seek them out okay okay sounds good another question is apart from London have you found any other lapidary or gemstone trading centers and other parts of Britain in the period you're examining? Um, from this part one, London really was the big one. Um, but when we start to get into later periods, um, of course, in the Victorian period, we didn't really talk about this in the article just because I didn't have the space for it. But Whitby, of course, was the center for jet mining and jet production. Mm -hmm. And then Birmingham, yeah, we didn't really touch on this either. This got edited out, but Birmingham was also like a big diamond and silver manufacturing hub um, in the 1900s and I think in the 1800s as well. Um, a lot of the diamond processing ended up going, uh, you know, there was big factories in, in Birmingham where they could never have a really big factory in London because it's just too crowded and expensive. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. And then other smaller places could have been like in the Lake District or I guess in the Midlands, like around around Derby, where John Maw was from. You know, there's a lot of minerals that come from there, like marble and stuff. And mm -hmm. so they were doing a lot of marble for not for gem, not for precious stones, but like for I'm guessing for countertops and other other applications where you'd use marble. Mm -hmm. They were doing a lot of marble processing in in Derby and around the sort of the the Midlands area. Um, so I guess, and then Cornwall has a um, serpentine that was ornamental for carving. I guess they're now, now the only thing I've ever seen carved in it is lighthouses, sort of a Ooh. famous, I think this is a dead, a dead art now. I think it's died in the last, uh, 10 or 20 years, but Sarah Steele, who I think, you know, who is a Gem A grad, she's gone down there a bunch of times and interviewed them. And I think she has an article, maybe it's a, a Gem A article, a Journal of Gemology article talking about the serpentine turners, you know, because I think they're on a lathe, not, they're not mm -hmm. carving it in the traditional way of, of mm -hmm. you know, normal carving. But um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, um, Blue John. That was another place I got to go visit in uh, in Castleton. And uh, anyone who hasn't been there, anyone who's in the UK and hasn't visited Castleton, you should go. It is so beautiful. And if you love gems, you can go down into the mine and see where the Blue John comes from. It's so cool. You know, this blue, blue and yellow fluorite. Um, it's so cool. And the town is so lovely. I, I stayed there for the weekend and it's it's like a picture postcard, beautiful secret mm -hmm. place because when you go there, you're like in a valley sort of and you 
you feel like you do kind of go back in time a little bit and mm -hmm. yeah so there's definitely some other hubs of of you know very small compared to what london was doing but mm -hmm. and i don't know if there was really any gem cutters around there as far as professionals but but of course since the 1940s and we talk about this in part two of the article there's a lot of hobbyist gem cutters spread all around the uk um and you know you can you can still find them today i got to visit some of them as well when i did my research trip and they're you know there's they're here and there hmm. um you can find them well great well thank you for all those insights and um that's all the questions we have and we probably should wrap it up here so yeah we've been thank here for you, a little while uh, thank you thank you again for joining us it's really been a pleasure and um thanks to everyone else who joined us from around the world and and we will sign out for now yeah see you next time and thank you uh definitely uh check out part one and part two will be uh in the beginning of next year the next issue right that's coming coming right up hopefully yeah they should be out by uh mid-december or so, so yeah i've already submitted part two so there's no chance that it's not going to come out so <laughs> this is definitely a two-parter it's already in the bag so good good now it's, um, now it's all up to you brendan we do have a, a new, another question that just popped in um, for anyone who wants to stay along um molding them and okay how do they decide which grid it is i believe this is another interesting topic to study um yeah that's that's true um this gets slightly technical and complicated but basically i think through experience they would have been able to figure out you know of course if, if your grit's too fine it takes too long to try to cut the stone you know if you try to use you know what we today call polishing grit to start the stone it would just take hours and hours to make one facet so you have to go through these stages and i think i mean they they knew this early on you know i i there's a great um, article. We reference it in here, um, and I'll just I'll just call it out real quick because it's a really good article that um, talks about the earliest documentation of gem cutting technology, the the, the polishing powders and the metals they're using. Um, the article is called Palito et Claro: The Art of Knowledge of Polishing by Bull. Um, it's in here, so if you have the article, you can find it. It's it's one of the it's first right. references. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, they talk. They have a really great uh, chart of all the early ones, and it goes back to like the 1100s. So even mm -hmm. in the 1100s, they're talking about using copper, using tin, using lead, and then you know, using emery powder, using carborundum powder. They weren't using diamond at that point yet, um, but you know, and using Tripoli, using all kinds of stuff i mean you know stuff that they were using in london as well but they're using it all over you know in 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 venice back in the really old olden days and then later in paris and then in london um but yeah that's a really great article for looking at early uh um you know different types of technical more, more technical stuff than you know the, the this one that we did in journal of gemology is really i i would see it as like a cultural exploration you know we're looking at the people and we didn't go super into the the, the techniques and stuff but that article by bull is really good and uh it, it really is a great roadmap for all these different you know uh, manuscripts that talk about gem cutting you know sort of recipes and mm -hmm. how they did it so yeah okay. check that one out okay good good to know good resource yeah. um the final question that came in is more for me this is um Question asking if there's a new find of appetite coming from Kenya lately that looks like yellow barrel. Um, actually, I don't know of, of that. Um, it's very possible, but um, as we do know with COVID, things have really slowed down from the on the production front. And um, I think maybe we'll have to wait and see. Perhaps some of this material will show up at one of the shows like at uh, Tucson this February, which I know, uh, Justin, you're planning to be at as well. and and uh, COVID willing, I will be there too. So anyway, yeah. Well, your your journey is easier than mine, so I don't think you will have a a great excuse. I've got a, an hour flight is all, yeah, from here in San yeah. Diego area. But uh, yeah. okay, well I know it's after midnight there for you, and uh, want to thank you again for for sticking with thank us. You. And, and uh, hopefully I'll you. see you at the Gem A party in Tucson. Yes, we'll see. All right. 
And thanks again to everyone else. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up now and signing off. Take care. See ya. Thank you.